The Lewis Burke Frumkiss Center for Writing and Culture at Hunter College presents 10 Years of Best-Selling Authors and Great Thinkers. Train yourself really to see things. A good way to do this is to pick an object at random once or twice a day and describe it to yourself in a way that feels fresh. Watch people carefully. The smallest actions, the apparently confident man who tugs constantly at his t-shirt that rides up over his stomach, can reveal a huge amount about a person's dreams and fears, his vanities and insecurities, and often contradict what he or she is saying. Actions do speak louder than words. Lucy Whitehouse, whose writing advice this is, was born in the Cotswolds and grew up in Warwickshire. She studied classics at Oxford University and then began a career in publishing while spending evenings, weekends, and holidays working on the book that would eventually become The House at Midnight. She has also written three other novels, including her present psychological thriller over there, Keep You Close, really will keep you on the edge of your seat, and it's very good. In addition to these books, Lucy also writes for magazines and journals, and has contributed features to the Times, the Sunday Times, Elle, and Red Magazine. Um, in 2011, she married a screenwriter, and now splits her time between the UK and the US. Lucy? Thank you, Lewis. First of all, adventures in microphones. Can everybody hear me? I'm a great mumbler. Yeah, good. Um, so first of all, thank you all so much for coming. Um, I feel a little bit semi, well, semi-fraudulent talking about psychological thrillers uh, in, and fiction tonight when, if you turned on the news, pretty much anything you heard would be both more outlandish than a thriller and more terrifying, I think. But, uh, but here we are. So um, I'm going to talk tonight about what I know about writing and uh, how I learned it. And even though I'm just starting work on my fifth novel, um, there are definitely still a lot of days when I think I know nothing about writing. And I, I've chosen to interpret this as a good sign, that uh, I'm still actively engaged in, in learning how to do it. Um, but just to put this all sort of in context to tell you a bit more um, than Lewis did about uh, who I am and where I come from, um, I'm British, of course. Um, and I um, grew up just outside Stratford-on-Avon, Shakespeare country. Um, and so I come from a very storied place, although in terms of people that you might want to emulate, I've set myself or my parents set me a bit of a challenge by living there, I think. Um, I came to the US in 2009 for an adventure and met my husband almost by, almost by accident, um, about six weeks into the 90 days that you get on a tourist visa, uh, and immediately thought, well, this is going to be inconvenient. But uh, I am now a proud immigrant, um, and, uh, but I'm also, a proud, I'm also a proud Brit. Um, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about, about where I grew up. I think probably the village that I come from played a big part in making me the, the person that I am. Um, I grew up in a village called Hazler, which uh, I know now dates from Saxon times. Uh, it's about six miles outside Stratford-on-Avon, um, and it was a place where history was all around you. It wasn't... Uh, it wasn't um, it wasn't a place that just happened to be old and you lived a modern life there. Um, my father had been married before he married my mother and had had a very bruising divorce where I think he basically left with a paperback and a, you know, a jumper. Um, and so when my parents got married, they bought a derelict cottage to do up. Um, but the... Uh, the cottage that they bought had been built in the 1660s originally, re built on after that to 
but largely built at that time. Um, and the reason it had been built then was the original village um, had been built around the church on the hill, but plague had come to the village in the 1660s. And so the original village had been burnt down um, and then rebuilt around the rim of the, the hill at the bottom, which is where we lived. Um, and when I, was, uh, when I was a new baby, because I had arrived earlier than my parents had planned, before they'd finished renovating this derelict cottage, um, I was almost taken into care because um, the, uh, the social workers around the area were worried that I was being exposed to microbes that hadn't been disturbed since the 1660s when this wattle and daub cottage was built. Um, I lived across the road from the old village stocks uh, where uh, ne'er-do-wells were pelted with rotten tomatoes and potato peelings. And I recently discovered that my, my best friend growing up, uh, the house that she'd lived in had been the Victorian workhouse. Um, and so there was very, much, was very much a sense of living history going on. Um, it was something that I was really aware of. Um, I think just kind of in my marrow from the start. Um, and I remember, I can remember where my love of books started too. That was also very young. Um, I had, uh, I have two very precise memories of living in that cottage, which I did till I was five. One of them was um, stacking books in a very OCD-ish manner by my bed. Um, and the other one was of the tiny village school that I went to, uh, where they gave out um, little puffin hardback storybooks to anybody who'd, who'd had a good term. And I remember watching my teacher sit on a bench inscribing all, all the books to the people who were going to get the prizes. And I, I just wanted one more than anything I think I'd ever seen before in my life. Um, and it was actually there um, that my, uh, the head teacher of my school there um, said to my parents, we think Lucy will be a writer, because they, they got into the habit of reading out little stories that I wrote, illustrated with the, the, the blue line of crayon for the sky and the green line for the grass. I think there must have really been a lot of uh, pressure on their book buying budget, but that is, uh, that is what they read out. And I, I took that nugget and uh, kept it with me, and it grew in my childhood. Uh, so I always had it in my mind that that was really something I'd, I'd like to do. Um, but I think uh, probably one of the most influential things for me in terms of writing the kind of books I do, which are psychological suspense and crime. Um, when I was 11, I started studying classics, um, I, Latin first, um, and then two years later, Greek. And that was a huge, huge thing for me. Um, it was, I think, uh, it's very strange. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has had the same experience, but I was a passionate lover of books and, and writing in English. I found English lessons at school incredibly boring. Um, and I really find it now when I think about it, I think, how did they manage to make something so potentially interesting so boring? Um, and so I was with my kind of bloodthirsty kind of uh, thread that had started pretty early. I, w I was getting my kicks from history with Henry VIII and his, uh, his headless wives and Elizabeth I and the Armada and, and the plague, of course. Um, but it wasn't until I started studying Latin and Greek literature at school that I got my hands on the good stuff and there was really no really no pussyfooting uh, about the classics department um, when we were 11 the first the first book that we learnt from uh, was called Ecce Romani here are, here are some Romans um, and the first it started off very uh, it started off very innocently. Caecilius est in horto. Uh, Caecilius is in the garden. And then by the end of the book, it was a kind of fiery cataclysm as Ves Vesuvius erupted and everybody died. Um, and that, uh, that drama really appealed to me. And then there was, there was Greek tragedy. Um, and that was a whole other world again. Um, I think uh, I had a moment when I was about 16, I had one of those moments that 
sort of come on you completely unexpectedly and change the way that you think about things. I had, um, all through my teenage years, I had an incredibly uh, embarrassing and unrequited crush on the kind of golden youth who went on our school bus. I lived, this, this village that I lived in was a mile, uh, was an hour's drive um, to school uh, every day. And so the bus community was a big part of our lives. Most of us were in love with James. Um, but it was obviously, uh, it was obviously a kind of big deal for me that he was a classicist, and so he, he came on lots of these kind of very recondite school trips that we went on to um, sort of stone amphitheaters where we sat and shivered in, you know, 43 degree temperatures um, and, and uh, other kind of crumbling bits of uh, Roman evidence. Um, but uh, we went, when I was 16, we went to see Hippolytus performed. And I remember sitting in the dark um, and watching on stage as, as Phaedra um, talked about her love for the completely unattainable, unhavable, totally verboten Hippolytus and just being shocked that a man who had lived in ancient Greece 2,500 years ago was describing exactly what I felt as a 16-year-old girl in rural Warwickshire. And that really just... It blew me away, and I, I think, you know, until that point, I, I'd read books, and I'd loved them, and I'd empathised with the characters. But that, for the first time, showed me how really brilliant writing can just capture something that is timelessly human, that sense of longing for something that you can't have in that, in that case. And it was, first of all, it, it decided me that I was absolutely going to do classics at college, but I think it made me also think that one day that was something that I wanted to try and capture in my writing. Obviously, you know, I'm a psychological thriller writer. He is one of the, Euripides is one of the best writers ever, but to even aim at something like that was something that really inspires me um, to, to write every day. It was just extraordinary. So classics, uh, classics it was, um, and I wrote at college, but mostly I had a good time and, uh, and read, and I wrote some small pieces of fiction, um, and I edited the student newspaper, which was great because I used it as a, a vessel to interview lots of interesting people like A.S. Byatt, for example, who was fascinating um, and really generous with her time. Um, and, uh, but I started, that was when I started writing um, little pieces of fiction. And I, now when I think about it, I, at the time, largely what I, what I remember of it was frustration, that I would start and I'd feel so fired up to write something. And then I, I would get to about a page and a half or two pages and it would grind to a halt. And I think now what I realize is that what I was trying to do was describe a mood or a feeling rather than something that had a narrative. Um, and so I didn't have enough to, sus to sustain a book, but I was, I was starting. Um, and occasionally at home, and so my mother's on a, a big drive to move house at the moment, which she can't do apparently until I've cleaned out my wardrobe um, at home. And so occasionally, every time I go home, I, I open up a box and I find one of these embarrassing pieces of writing from when I was 20. <laughs> Um, and quickly burn it. Um, but at college, I started, I started making a lot of friends who were equally passionate about books, about reading, but also about writing. Um, and quite a lot of them have gone on to be instrumental in different ways um, in sort of the professional side of my writing life now. After college, um, I briefly flirted with the idea of going into journalism and I worked for Tatler magazine for a year as a sub-editor which um, really appealed to me because I do have my, my OCD side um, and so the stickling about semicolons for a living was a joy to me, Re really fun. Um, but after about a year I realized that I, I couldn't be a fashion journalist I just 
I'm not stylish enough, essentially. Um, and there are a lot of people who are and who are good at that. And, you know, it should be left to people who know what they're doing. Um, but at that point, a friend of mine had started working at a literary agency. And he said, why don't you go into publishing if you're such a, such a book fiend? And I thought, wow, you know, why had I never thought of that? Um, my, my mother likes to... Uh, likes to remark on how naive I was in my early 20s. Um, she, she generally does it only at the times when it's most embarrassing, but uh, she says, you are naive, Lucy. Uh, so thanks, Mum. Um, but uh, that, I mean, that, that it hadn't occurred to me that working in publishing might be just my thing is astonishing to me now. But uh, so I started applying for jobs and eventually um, I got one working for a maker of unabridged audio books. Um, uh, and Isis Publishing, they, they chose which books to make into um, wholly unabridged books, so, which meant that essentially we could read all the time to work out which ones were going to be uh, we're going to be read, and that was a dream job. Um, but from there, I found what I really wanted to do on the publishing side, which was to be a literary agent. Um, and so after about three years of working at ISIS, I went to work for Darlie Anderson, who um, is... Uh, well, he's a, he's a kind of British super agent, and his speciality is um, huge... Um, thriller writers. Uh, Lee Child is perhaps his biggest um, client. John Connolly too, Tana French, um, Martina Cole, who's huge in England, not so well known here, but really a lot of kind of big, big names um, in thriller writing. And that was another kind of education. Um, but uh, it was it was fascinating. I think the the united the kind of united thing that they they all had in common was how hard they worked. It was really extraordinary. Uh, now, as somebody who's been writing for years and has have written four books, the fact that Lee writes a book of the same quality every year, I and has done I, th I forget how many books he's written now, as nineteen, seventeen, something. Something like that, but to keep doing it. And he used to joke, um, he used to say, oh, well, I was late to deliver this year. I was supposed to deliver on the 27th, but I delivered at half midnight, so technically it was the 28th. Um, and everybody else, all our other um, clients were phoning up and go, do you think they'll mind if I'm three months late? I mean, I've just, I've just realized that there's a whole bit in the middle that doesn't work. Can I do, do you think I've got time to do it again before I send it in? Um, but that seeing how those seeing how those writers worked was was fascinating. Um, just how they worked, but also the business the business side of um, the business side of it. Seeing sort of how books were bought, uh, at what stage, whether it was whole manuscripts, proposals, how much work was done by editors, how much was done by an author getting feedback well, on their own first, and then with the agent's feedback, and then by editors, so I learned a lot by that. Um, but I, I feel like in my, in my whole sort of writing and studying and publishing life, I've always been quite binary. Um, I think writing it's, itself is a, very, uh, is a very binary profession in, in some ways. I think quite a lot of people who write for a living do it because they're introverts and you work on your own for a year, two years, however long it takes you to, to work, your writing pace. And then for sort of one or two frenzied months afterwards, people expect you to go out and talk to people and you haven't emerged from your pajamas for, for 18 months. I saw a brilliant thing yesterday on social media, which was the life cycle of a book. And it started off with you know, self-doubt um, and then all the creative process and then the editing and typesetting and cover design. And then it all led down to one point at the beginning, which was said, marketing is passed to the author, a natural intro introvert who got into this business in the first place so they wouldn't have to talk to anybody. And I thought, Yes, I, I, see, I see exactly that. R one of the things I always find when I, quite often, not always, there are exceptions, of course, um, but quite a lot of 
writers get absolutely petrified about coming to talk because it just feels so kind of out of practice. Um, I think uh, th this binariness as well. I mean, I I see it in all the all the various aspects of of what I do and the kind of things that I've enjoyed. Um, on the one hand, for example, I love classics because, and the Greek tragedies in particular, because of the scale and and scope of the stories, the murders, the the uh, you know the curses, the the people who fall on their own swords. And then on the on the other hand of it, I I love thinking: is this is this a subjunctive that they're using here? This is you know the study of the language and particularly um, well particularly Greek. Um, apparently you're either a natural Latin person or a natural Greek person. I was much more of a Greek person. I also love Latin, though, just because the logic of it. And I think studying studying Latin and Greek made me a real etymology geek. And I remember my, uh, my aunt said to my mother, what a waste that Lucy's going to do classics at college. Couldn't she, couldn't she do something relevant? Um, but I find that I use my degree every day when I'm thinking about words. Um, it really helps me to, it helps me to write with a, a proper understanding, I think, to use words properly. And although I write psychological suspense and commercial novels, I care about my writing on a, a sentence by sentence, word by word basis a great deal. So it's been very important to me to, to have that understanding. But in my mid-twenties, I, I had the thing that, was, uh, that I'd been waiting for for a long time, which was a sort of an idea with movement. So the pieces, of, uh, the pieces of writing that I'd been doing that were, um, you know, the page and a half long where I was trying to express a kind of mood or an atmosphere or, or something that I'd noticed suddenly became a mood plus a situation which gave me a kind of movement and that was enough to that was enough to start building a book around um the idea for my first book which was house at midnight um which was published in 2008 um came when i was sitting in the back of a car driving out of oxford on a really beautiful quite quintessentially english i think um evening at about six o'clock and the light was just beginning to mellow and there were six of us in this tiny car, which belonged to my boyfriend. He was a medical student. Um, and he'd been living for a year in a house with um, four other people, all of whom were about to finish doing their graduate degrees and go back to the kind of four corners of the earth that they'd come from. And there was a real, um, there was a real sense of the end of, uh, the end of an era and the end of the year and the light beginning to mellow, those two things joined together in my mind. And I thought, I think, I think this is the start of what I've been looking for, the start of a book that I want to write. Um, and of course, my, I had the, the feeling that I always have when I start a new book, and which I have now, which I, I'm just, uh, I'm supposed to be delivering the first two chapters of my new book to my agent on March the 1st, and so of course I'm completely paralyzed. Um, but uh, the, fir the first, the feeling that I always have at this stage is a mixture of kind of excitement and um, apprehension. Um, and it was particularly bad with the, with the first one because I had no idea what I, what I was doing. And having wanted to write for so long, I think I had a sense that, what if I start doing this and find I can't do it? And for the last 20 years, I've been dreaming of something which I have no aptitude for. Um, so, as so often, the answer to that is wine. So I bought a bottle of wine and I locked... <laughs> I uh, locked myself in the garden and told myself I couldn't come inside until I have three pages. Um, and so that's what I did. Um, and not a word of those three pages, and particularly not the second two of those three pages. The first one was all right. The sense began to get fuzzy somewhere around the bottom of uh, page, well, top of page two. Um, but I'd, I'd started, um, and that, that was a big deal and I think I, I made a commitment to writing at that point um, I still had my pretty uh, pretty full-on 
day job and I wrote the whole of my first book while I had a day job. Um, and I'm very glad I did. First of all, because it took me so long and I would have been incredibly thin if I hadn't eaten for six years. Um, but also because it, it's, I think it's a big problem when you disconnect from the real world when you're writing. I think that's very, uh, very important to, to be out there and, and seeing things. Um, but it, it took me six years to write. And I think uh, in the wardrobe that my mother is uh, slowly um, persecuting me about um, is a huge plastic bag of chapters um, early drafts of chapters of my first book. And I've kind of worked out in the past that I probably wrote a million words for the 120,000 that were eventually published. But it was like doing an apprenticeship. Um, and I, I remember at the beginning just thinking, you know, being proud of something I'd written and then rereading it three weeks later and thinking, no, this is awful. And thinking, well, just don't get dispirited. It was... Um, very much like uh, standing on the edge of a cliff, I think, and you just have to not look down and just and just keep going. Um, but one of the one of the things I found tremendously helpful was that um, one of my friends from college was doing um, an MA at the uh, at the Oxford um, Continuing Education College um, in creative writing. And although I didn't do that, she had a collection, a small group of friends that she'd met on the course, and they had a writing group that was very professional. Um, and one of their members left to go and do the MFA at Iowa, and they asked me if I wanted to join. Um, and so I did. Um, but I, I don't think that I'd really kind of anticipated what I was going to be getting into, because these people were very serious, uh, and they... they said we'll send you chapters by post every three weeks we meet on a sunday we'll send you there's six of us will we read a chapter of three people's work every every sunday and we talk about it with you in the room and you're not allowed to say anything while this is going on um and they pulled no punches um so it was, uh, so we, uh, my friend Katie and I had a regular date afterwards to go and have a martini after we'd been there. So it was, after we'd been to this group, it was really kind of, it was like having surgery done sometimes. But it, it, uh, it was a very galvanizing thing, not only because I was getting such high quality feedback from these people, but also um, because it meant that I couldn't say, oh, well, I've been so busy, you know, it's been the Frankfurt Book Fair and I haven't had chance to write. I just had to, if I didn't want to miss my slot, I would have to have a chapter that I was prepared to show of a kind of decent enough standard every six weeks. Um, and they taught me a huge amount. Of, it's something I, I really recommend. When I, when I think now about whether or not I'd like to join a writing group, I think not, because I think, you know, I've, I now do this professionally, and I think uh, I don't need my weaknesses exposed because I, I'm only too aware of them. But uh, when I was starting out, that was, that was tremendously helpful to me. But after, after six years of working on this book, um, I... Uh, and still, I was still working at the agency, and I used to, my job there was selling translation rights. So, for example, I used to sell um, Lee Child's rights to uh, German rights, Russian rights, Japanese rights, um, to be translated uh, into those languages. Um, and I had a great friend who was a German agent, um, much older than me. He's, well, I think he, he must be nearly 70 now. He's still my friend. Uh, and still my agent. Um, but we went out to dinner one night, and he said to me, I think you write. And I said, no, 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 no. You know, I sell translation rights. He said, no, I think you write, and I have a meeting with you at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning in the diary, so you'll bring me the first 100 pages, and I'll read them on the plane back to Germany. Um, so I went home in a flap and phoned up my best friend and said, what do I do? And she said, I can't believe you're even asking me this question. And you show him the 100 pages, of course. Um, and so I did. And the next thing I knew, I had a phone call from him saying, I think that I can sell this book in Germany. Um, so 
even though I'm English and I was writing in English, my book was sold in Germany first. And it was the, yeah, it was the um, German um, editor who bought the book who put me in touch with um, the, the English agent who then represented me and sold the book um, in England and the US and, and various other places. So it was a very roundabout way to get published. But, um, you know, good, I think. Um, but definitely, definitely unusual to be published in, in German first as an English writer. Um, but that was, that was the start. Um, and then after that, I think the four, the three books that I've written since, and the one that I'm about to start writing now, um, it's all been it's all been about a learning curve in terms of craft. Something that I've become really aware of is just how much of a craft writing is, um, and how how much there is to learn. Never stop learning. I think reading now for me is has. There are there are books that I can read and be so absorbed by that I that I turn off my critical facility. But quite a lot of times, I'm reading. I'm thinking, "Wow, that was good. How how did they manage to do that? How did you get that effect? Why do I feel like that?" Um, so, I feel I feel like I'm I'm always learning, and I try to read people who are better than me, so I I can learn how they do what they do. But I think everybody has, so all writers have something. Um, that they can teach you. So I read across the spectrum. I'm a huge crime and thriller uh, reader, as you would expect. Um, I think my uh, I think my favourite writer is probably Graham Greene, um, who I adore, um, and Dickens actually. Who for years I resisted. As a teenager, I started two or three Dickens and just thought I just cannot stand this man's voice. You know, I just it's it's. It's complete anathema to me. Then when I was about 30, I thought, this is embarrassing. Well, it must have been 35. Um, I thought, it's embarrassing to be a published writer and to hope to do this for a living and not have read any Dickens. So I read A Tale of Two Cities, and then I read another eight. And I just thought, he's amazing. This is obviously the time in my life where I was supposed to read him. Um, my second book, uh, I wrote in a completely different way than my first. Um, as you've probably gathered, I, when I wrote The House at Midnight, I was, not, um, I was not somebody who planned a plot before I started writing. Um, that book was totally a voyage of um, exploration for me. That I just kind of followed where I, I thought the story was going to take me, and then I rewrote and rewrote and rewrote and would spend kind of two months writing myself down a cul-de-sac and then have to chuck all that stuff in the bin And because I realized that something really quite important didn't tie up. But it had, in the process of writing those things, I had discovered a couple of other things that felt intrinsic. Um, so that was part of the reason why that book took so long to write. Um, and the second book I wrote in a similar way, although um, I, by that time, worked part-time. So I had, I could do it in a, a sh I, well, I just worked non-stop basically, but um, I did it much faster because I, having worked at this very commercial agency, I became aware that if you write a commercial kind of book, there is a pressure on you to produce work fairly regularly. Um, and I just had this mental image of Lee Child in my head all the time, just like sending off his emails at, at 12.30, the day after his deadline, with another immaculate thriller, while I was kind of up in my, uh, up in my loft bedroom in my uh, Victorian flat, just thinking, ah! Um, so the, the second book I, I wrote in the same way, just starting off with the, the kernel of an idea, which is... Uh, the story of that book is a uh, reckless a reckless girl gets involved um, uh, in a relationship that she doesn't understand and and um, pays the price really luckily not the ultimate price but um, that part of that book for me what I what I wanted to explore was trying to go back to a place that um, that have been important at an earlier age quite often my books are about um, working out knotty childhood problems in the context 
of the kind of adult um, neuroses that they have manifested themselves as mother. Um, and this, this book was set on the Isle of Wight where I spent a lot of time as a child and I just, I loved writing it so much because I don't know if anybody knows the Isle of Wight but it's, it's like a little bit of England that is still 1950. It's, the ferry crossing only takes 40 minutes but uh, you feel as if you're, you're going back in time. It's, it's an amazing place and I wanted to capture that sense of isolation and um, kind of wildness and being out of time and the swing of things. Um, that was, there's much talk in, there's much talk amongst uh, writers of difficult second novels, but that, I was very lucky with that one. It was not, uh, it was not the great um, difficulty uh, that I had expected. Um, and I also, I also was very lucky that it was chosen for a TV book club um, in England, and so I got to do lots of fun things like walking up cliffs, which I'd um, written about uh, in the book um, with camera crews who were cursing me as they kind of carried these enormous things. I was like, ah, I think it's only you know 500 more feet. Um, it's really steep, windy places, but. Uh, it was uh, so that that was that was a lucky thing, and I had a lot of fun with that book. But I had a difficult third novel instead, um, and that was a book that was a book that changed the way I wrote. Um, until then, I well, the first two books had done this very exploratory method of working out what the story was and then finessing it, um, and I did that with a third book, and I ended up with a book that just didn't work. Um, it had, um, the, the central idea of, of the book is a woman who marries in haste um, and does indeed repent at leisure when she discovers that her husband has a secret, uh, no, no clue of which she'd ever um, had reason even to suspect. Um, and when I, when I started work on that book, the original draft, the idea was that he had a huge debt and that he'd essentially perjured his soul trying to A, keep it hidden and eventually pay it back. Um, and uh, he was a charity worker who spent time in Sierra Leone and it was about stealing and corruption and diamond mines. Um, and I wrote it and I hated it, um, so I threw it in the bin. Um, and it was very painful because it was about 18 months work. Um, and then I wrote another version and I didn't like that either. Um, but my agent said, you have lived with this book too long now, we have to send it out and see what people think. Um, and so we did. And my editor said, I will buy it on the condition that you do some work. And then she sent me nine pages of editorial notes, single spaced. Um, and I had a long dark night at the soul and I, I phoned her up and said, I, I will do the, well, I had had the idea for my fourth book by then. So I phoned her up and said, Helen, how, how would you feel if I just junked this book and wrote the fourth one? And she said, no, I really want you to write this one. And I said, well, in that case, I've got to throw it in the bin completely and start from scratch. And she said, fine, send me an outline of what you're going to do. Um, and so at that point, um, I discovered that I was pregnant um, and I'd married and I'd moved to Brooklyn. But I, this was October and I was expecting my baby in April. And so suddenly I had time pressure in a way that I'd never had before. Um, and also having written two versions of this book that I didn't like and didn't feel were good enough, I thought, I can't, I can't do this the same way. I'm, I'm going to go against every fiber in my body and plot this book. Um, and so I did, and it was, it was tough. Um, I think uh, as a, it was a tough learning experience. Uh, one of the things, I can't remember whether you mentioned, Lewis, or not, that I'm married to a screenwriter. Um, and one of the things 
that I have always found really weird about the way that he works is that he knows the whole thing before he starts. Um, and I obviously didn't work like that. But I, I wanted to learn. So I read a lot of the kind of key texts that, that screenwriters use. I read Joseph Campbell um, and uh, read a lot about story archetypes and the seven types of story. And it's kind of, uh, then I read Sid Field. Um, on um, <clears throat> story story structure and where things in a satisfying film happen with the three act structure where your where your breaks come where the major developments in stories are supposed to happen and it taught me a lot um, I think that until until that point when I wrote I had been sort of uncovering these things gradually with the kind of going against the intrinsic idea of a story that I had from years of obsessive reading. I think, I think we all have a sense of the shape of a story and what those screenwriting rules are is just an explicit statement of them. Um, but it enabled me to think about my story in a really structured way. And I thought, I'm going to go back to basics and keep this really simple and see if I can make something more scary for that. So no Sierra Leone, no diamonds, um, but it was much more, the book was about really about violence against women and having, having struggled so much with that book, it then went on to be my bestseller. So um, it was a kind of lesson in persistence that, that paid off, um, but uh, it was, it was quite a challenge. My, uh, I got so stressed by trying to finish it by the April deadline when my daughter was going to be born that uh, I gave myself essentially preeclampsia. I gave myself really high blood pressure, which didn't really help because my daughter then was born three weeks early. So, you know, I had to finish the book in the first six weeks of her life, which was a challenge um, because a pub date had been set and there was no getting around it. Um, but that that was very good. Uh, that was very good discipline too, because I think it taught me that you know there's a lot of there's a lot of romance about writing and the, and the creative process. You have your time of the day when you can do it, and you're a morning person, you're a night person. You can only write, you know, in an east-facing room with natural light. And and I, having had my my daughter, I realised that you know as long as you uh, as long as you have some coffee, you can write at any time of day. Um, I, I'm definitely still a night writer. That's all. That's you know the joyous time for me to write. And I did for a while try the getting up at 5 a.m. to work or write before work thing, but uh, it was completely fruitless. I just sat staring into middle distance, collecting dust on my eyeballs for about two hours, and then went to work. Um, or I would write, write three sentences, which I would delete immediately when I got home. So I started doing the late night thing. But having, having a child has been very, uh, very instructive for, for writing. It's really made me a lot more disciplined. Um, and also now it has made me a committed plotter. Uh, Keep You Close, which is my most recent published book, which came out in, hardback, uh, in paperback two weeks ago. Um, that I plotted very carefully, um, and I, I'm proud of it. I have to say because I, I think if I had if I'd written that book in the exploratory uh, fashion, it would have taken me many moons uh, because it is quite intricate. But uh, I, I'm seeing that as a as a triumph of uh, of character. Um, and getting getting over my. Uh, Getting over my uh, what's what's the word? Um, getting over my romance and realizing now that I'm a professional writer, but marrying those two things, marrying the love of the story and the scope with the the discipline to write regularly, I think it's it's the way forward. I can see. Yeah. <laughs> Lady right there. Are your books on audio and audiobooks? And um, if so, do you read them? 
Um, I don't. Um, they are. Uh, they are available as audiobooks, yes. Um, not abridged, only unabridged, the full thing. But strangely, my sister reads them um, because she is a, a trained voice artist. Um, and so she, she reads them. It's perfect because she, she knows my voice better than almost anybody, um, but reads much better than I do. So it's, uh, it's ideal. Are you going to try anything else, or are you going to stay with thrillers? Nothing wrong with that at all. I'm just wondering if... Um, I am actually doing a bit of a shift now. I think that's one of the reasons why this book that I'm just starting um, is... I've got that kind of that same sense of, I don't know, kind of apprehension about starting something new. Um, my genre... Um, has become wildly popular since The Girl on the Train and, uh, and Gone Girl. Um, and I, I'm beginning to reach, well, I have reached saturation point. Um, I get sent quite a lot of um, books to give quotes for blurbs on the back. And the psychological suspense, you know, comes through my door. And I think, I'm not sure I can read and even read another one, let, a, let alone write another one. Um, I feel, I feel like I'm done, but I love writing crime. Um, but also I feel I've reached a point where I'm ready to write something bigger. Um, and so I want to, my next book, um, which is gonna be called Second City, is um, set in, in Birmingham, um, which is England's second city. Um, and it's gonna be a crime story set there. It's about going back to places, looking at them differently. It's, it's very much a kind of, uh, Birmingham's going through a kind of similar arc as Detroit. It was, uh, it was a real metal, metal working town. It was known as the city of a thousand trades, all of them kind of fine metal work and uh, also cars um, too, but uh, still the fine metal work and lots of jewelry, but it went through a huge decline. Um, and I want to my, this is all very convoluted and probably far too much detail, sorry. No, this is uh, great. <laughs> um, my dad ran an engineering business that was, was originally based in Birmingham and then moved out to have, a, to have bigger premises. And when I, was, uh, when I was a child, his factory was one on a street of working factories. Um, but now his factory is the only one that's still going. My father's died, so it's run by um, my cousins now. So, and I don't know how much longer it's going to last under their aegis, I have to say. Um, but I became fascinated by that. Kind of what, would, what would the effects be of a, a business that had been held through, say, five generations, which my father has five generations of factory uh, in one family? What happens if you're the person under whom it goes bankrupt? And what, what effect does that have on your family? And what do you do to compensate? How do you suddenly go from being part of this to doing something different? And financially, how do you cope? Which is where the crime comes in, of course. But uh, there's a lot more history in there and there's um, flavor of the city. I love writing about place. This is something that all my books have in common. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I'm gonna do next. So it'll be crime, but not suspense, I think. Norman? How do you distinguish between fiction and nonfiction? And then how do you distinguish between the fictional writer and the nonfictional writer? In myself or? Just generally. Oof. I think uh, if you were going to do it in a, a nutshell, I think that uh, fiction writers tell the truth through fabrication. Um, and good, uh, good non-fiction writers try and avoid the fabrication and just have the truth. But I think the the emotional the emotional truth through fabrication is fiction. I would say. So you're saying that fictional emotional truth is is a stronger truth than what the non-fiction writer would. No, not, not at all. Um, and I think some of my favorite nonfiction to, to read is um, very kind of strongly narrative nonfiction. Um, and so I think, a good, I think 
a good non-fiction writer has all the skills of a fiction writer, um, but also has, you know, also has the research and truth-telling part of that. Um, if that makes sense. Any other questions? If not, why don't you all enjoy some refreshments? Why don't you come up and meet Lucy here, purchase one of her books if you'd like, and she'll be happy to inscribe it. Do you have a question? One question, I'm sorry. <laughs> If I wasn't a writer, ooh. What would Lucy do if she were not a writer? Dreams and aspirations. Dreams and aspirations, I had a, I had a, a, a brief time of thinking I'd like to be a doctor, um, but I'm not sure that that would have worked for me in the long term, but it's something that I really admire, um, particularly surgery. I mean. I've been up close and personal with quite a lot of surgery over the last few years. My father had an aneurysm, which was horrendous. And uh, the person who saved his life was, I mean, just to, to do that, phenomenal. He operated for 12 hours in one go. And I'm not sure I could even stand up for 12 hours, let alone, you know, let alone operate on somebody so finely. Um, history, I think. I, I, I could imagine myself teaching history, I think. I'm just getting nerdier and nerdier as I get older, so it's, uh, you know, don't come and see me when I'm 70 unless you want to be bored rigid. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.